Hello, everyone. Uh, members of the Rockville Art League, thank you for entering our spring 2023 juried members show uh, and for viewing this conversation with our judge, Jay Jordan Bruns. The focus today will be on the award winning artwork, uh, but please do yourself a favor uh, and see the show in person. Um, it, it, art is best viewed in person. But when you need to look at it from the comfort of your home or a second time, we have this, uh, our virtual show up. And today we're going to have a discussion of the award winning pieces primarily. Our jury show chair, Lisa Sieg, has some comments about the show in general. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, for all your hard work on jurying this um, beautiful show for us, first of all. And thank you to all the artists who entered work into this juried member spring show. There were over 200 entries for the show with 130 pieces in a variety of mediums accepted. This is a large show. It's bold and beautiful, full of color and unique artistry. There are six categories of mediums accepted into this show. We've got oils and acrylics, which is our largest category, followed by watercolors, then there's drawings, pastels, hand-pulled prints, and mixed media, collage, experimental, original computer-generated art is another category, followed by sculpture in the last category, but not least is photography. So those are the six categories we'll be, we will be looking at today. And as Patrick mentioned, the virtual show um, is available. It was sent out to all members on Thursday but you can see it on the Rockville Art League website, which is rockvilleartleague.org. And it's listed as RAL, juried members, spring show, in a white button. Just click on it, it will take you right there. And please do take a few minutes to look at it. Here you'll see a brief description of the show, including any gallery closures, which we try to keep updated. <laughs> the address of Glenview, followed by the judge's remarks about the show. It's all very interesting and beautiful to look at. Um, and you can scroll down and see all the artwork. Um, you can share the virtual show if you'd like. If you're interested in a piece, um, you can find details about it, you know, the dimensions, the price, um, a way to inquire about it, or even purchase if you'd like. Sometimes there's a brief description and if the piece has been awarded a prize, it will be listed here as well. And of course, as we always like to say, art is best viewed in person. So please go to Glenview Mansion Art Gallery. It's open Monday through Friday, weekdays only, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. But please check the website for Glenview Mansion Art Gallery, um, or just says Glenview Mansion. And it will tell you any closures because for instance, this week, it will, um, it's closed three days. So um, don't show up on those days. So that's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday of this week. But anyway, the show cards are posted um, on the virtual show as well. It has the information about a phone number for Glenview. If you'd like to call before coming out, that would be a good idea too. And if you haven't seen the show, you are in for a real treat. So please come. If you've seen it already, you'll want to come again. I just, I'm sure of that and bring a friend, <laughs> it's great. There's plenty of parking and the gallery is uncrowded during the week. So you can really focus on the art, which is quite beautiful. So thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, also with us uh, in today's recording, we've got uh, artist and instructor, Jay Jordan Bruns. He did the very difficult task of judging our spring show. Jordan is currently the artist in residence at Glen Echo Park. If you visit the park, please look for him. He'll be painting plain air, or he'll be uh, in his studio in the stone tower, the historic stone tower. He also, uh, yeah, there he is right there. Uh, he also teaches class in that tower. And if you have a chance, you should take one because he keeps the, it, the, the group small, lots of personal attention and lots of great uh, uh, cues, clues about, you know, what's the best way to do things, et cetera. Jordan did his undergrad studies at the Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA, uh, with a focus on illustration. I think I'm right about that, uh, undergrad. He then completed his graduate studies with a focus on painting 
at uh, Indiana uh, University in beautiful Bloomington, Indiana. Um, Jordan is also a world traveler and those travels have influenced his vision. Uh, and before we start our, our slideshow, Jordan, any general comments? Um, well, I, I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity to uh, be a part of this exhibition. Um, it was, like you said, an incredibly difficult um, task of, of deciding, number one, who was in the show, and number two, how do I rank the, the choices that I did? Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to see the work in person as well as virtual, so uh, to kind of solidify those, those, um, those placeholders that we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to see the work, like you said, Art is best seen in person, so I got to uh, check these out before they um, were hung on the wall. So uh, thank you guys again for just an incredible job of uh, executing the show uh, from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, it's been an amazing experience. And thank you to all the artists who submitted work. And if you didn't get in, I'm sorry, it, my opinion is only just mine, but uh, I encourage you all to continue working, continue painting, uh, and, um, and it, it'll apply again with a different judge and see what happens. All right, I will go ahead and start the, the uh, slideshow. All right, hopefully, um, can we all see uh, the Rockville Art League uh, first slide? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it's our, this is a, a slideshow focused on our award-winning art. As Lisa mentioned earlier, there were six categories and we will go through each of the categories. I mentioned that you could um, view Jordan plein air painting and here's a shot of him right now in, in front of the, the famous uh, arcade and, and uh, the, the carousel and a uh, beautiful picture in progress. <laughs> that was a, a, a color spot painting that was uh, my, my mentor Ephraim Ruben Stein who uh, is, he teaches at the Art Students League in New York City. Um, but he uh, does this approach of painting where there's little drawing, if not any drawing, it's actually, or he, he draws a lot, but I actually have started this painting and execute all the paintings without any drawing. Uh, but this is uh, kind of a, the nice part about this style of painting is, and I'm gonna actually relate this to some of the work in the show is, is there surprises in it? You know, if I knew where everything's gonna go from the very get go, I think the painting for me would be not as, as exciting. So I'm looking for in painting that surprise, that something that is different or interesting that I probably, if I were to set out painting the carousel and I knew where all the people were gonna go and so forth, I think it would be very boring. And I think the end of the painting, not only the process, but the end of the painting would not have that same flair to it, so. Jordan, I don't think anybody has ever called any of your paintings boring. Well, I've called them boring at times. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank right, you. So let's Let's go ahead and jump into our, our first category, uh, oils and acrylics, um, which by the way, was the largest uh, of the six categories. And uh, shall we go ahead and jump into, we're gonna go walk through these from honorable mention, kind of building um, you know, to the larger awards, you know, ending each category with the, the uh, first prize. So let's go ahead and jump in oils and acrylics. Oh, Patrick, this is a lovely painting. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought this was an, an uh, out of the two you submitted, I, I preferred this one. I, I thought that this one actually read to me uh, almost like an abstract painting. Uh, and I also talked to students about the idea of color balance within a painting where, you know, you have a large quantity of one color. In this, in this case, it's green. And when you dominate the, the palette with one color, uh, how the other colors have more of a presence in the painting. So the reds of the koi fish, I imagine there's some sort of koi fish, uh, and the lilies, and actually that red dot right in the back kind of middle of that painting. It's amazing how those colors really become uh, more important uh, with, the, with the large dominance of that green color. And it's a very abstract way of thinking about it. So uh, I like this painting quite a, a lot. And I like the atmosphere you're getting, even though you're changing the color very little from the foreground to the background. And that's a hard thing to do. Okay, thank, thank you very much for those comments. Sure. Our next uh, honorable mention, Robert Perlman, Kent Island Crab Deck. 
This one actually kind of had that copper-esque light. And, you know, I'm a big fan of copper, as you'll probably kind of tell throughout the, the talk today. Um, but the brush strokes, for instance, the layering of the paint, I think it had a nice kind of juicy quality that it doesn't actually show so much in the slide. You'll have to actually go visit the painting in person, which uh, you, you'll think, wow, what an incredible piece uh, when you see it in person. But, you know, aside from the abstract shapes and the corners and the way the uh, building is kind of, uh, repeated with the shape of the umbrellas. That kind of dark stripe there where all the action, where all the people are, is actually a really fun place to explore while looking at the painting in person. So uh, again, it, it's fun to find little pieces of a painting uh, where you can find new things the more you look at it. And this is one of them. Okay, thank you. Our next honorable mention, Karen Epstein, Marsh Light. I love this painting simply for the atmosphere. Uh, there's I, a lot of my abstract paintings and even my plein air paintings as well. Uh, I look for those places where I can create a large amount of space within a, a small confine of the, of the canvas. Uh, and with a very minimal palette, Karen's done a great job of creating that depth and space, repeating of colors. Even within the, these kind of green masses, she's finding very subtle differences of, of the hue and the value of the color to create a, a large sense of distance and a certain kind of mood uh, with those colors. So uh, a beautiful painting and um, I really enjoy just the, the kind of lead into the canvas with those directional lines of the grass on the right kind of leading me back into space. So very nice painting. I, uh, I particularly like that tree. While it's a pretty prominent part, um, she was still able to make you feel like it's set back. So yeah, that's one of those uh, small elements that you kind of discover the more you look at the painting, you find those little places where you can hide, hang out and hide out. And also even the reflection of that tree in the water was exceptionally done. Wonderful, thank you. Next honorable mention, Robert Lamar, Jean's Costumes. Yeah, I, I like this painting just because of the, the arrangement within the boundaries of the picture plane. Uh, plus I have a kind of a, a, a soft spot for any power lines that are involved in any landscape painting. Uh, they just create those really exciting directional lines that kind of lead the eye to uh, the focal point. So uh, I think of this as just, you know, like I think of any, uh, you know, hopper painting or any landscape painting where there's a lot of uh, architecture involved with it. Um, but what I thought was kind of unique about this painting is, you know, you have these cars, which are really kind of in, in um, you know, they're complex forms to actually execute in paint. And because of the values, the way they're kind of composed, I actually bypass all that complexity and go back into the uh, into the landscape and enter in the front door of this of Glenn's costumes there. And all the directional lines, the staircases, the poles, the sign kind of tilted in, in its certain way are kind of leading me into that building. Uh, so uh, this is a compositional masterpiece. Uh, uh, in my opinion. Well, and it was so funny yesterday in the, in the reception, and, and by the way, we had you know, more than 160 people in attendance uh, at the uh, Meet the Artist event. So many commented that they knew exactly where this was. So, so Teen's costume Road? is not only a fixture, but it's now been immortalized in Robert Lamar's painting. I think it's on Coles Road. I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> or near there. Yeah, I guess. Uh, our next honorable mention, Michelle Morgan, Arrival. Yeah, I, I found a lot of uh, uh, things that I enjoy about abstract painting uh, in this painting. Uh, a lot of atmosphere, like I've been saying, uh, with you know, kind of landscape. I think that you can create atmosphere in abstract painting. It doesn't always have to be surface based. Uh, so this felt like you know, some big event that happened. And I almost imagine this kind of small landscape at the bottom of the painting and this large action that happened uh, kind of in the core of the center of the painting here. Uh, I love opportunities in abstract paintings where the artist has given me a place for my eye to rest. So that center, that kind of beautiful pale yellow is, acts as this wonderful place for my eye to rest. So all the complex and very uh, quick and kind of more spontaneous uh, action-based brushstrokes can have a, a more presence within the painting boundaries. I've often heard that abstract painter, abstract paintings often feel like landscapes. And, and as you mentioned, there's some landscape feeling elements, but I also feel like that central thing could have been a figure just as well. Yeah, absolutely. Or fish jumping out of the water. Yeah, there you go. We all see what we want to see within paintings, one degree or another. <laughs> That's true. Um, third prize, Alden Schofield, Great Falls. This is just a technically incredible painting. Uh, 
uh, you know, it looks like a photograph from right off the bat. Um, it's just the attention and the time that went into a painting like this. I can't even imagine. Uh, Alden is a fabulous painter. Uh, I've seen his work before. Uh, and it definitely, you know, looks and feels like Great Falls. I think one problem that painters often have when working is, you know, what can paint add to the original reference? You know, Alden's most likely working from photograph in this situation. I can't imagine he's able to, or anyone's able to create that kind of wave structure from photo or without photographic uh, help. But what he's actually added to the photo is kind of the smell and the sound of that waves, the water crashing. Uh, there's a very distinctive kind of um, atmosphere that has, is Great Falls, you know, the water, uh, creating those vapors that you can smell, you can hear. And I think that anyone who's been to Great Falls is going to have those reminders of what it feels like to be there. Uh, and they'll have those kind of resurface when they're uh, observing the painting. When I, uh, yesterday in the in the opening, uh, Meet the Artist, uh, I, I, I felt like I could hear the roar, uh, you know, of the waterfall. But it also might have been that there were 160 people in the in the opening so <laughs> there was a roar either way it was a fabulous reception so i thank you guys for that second prize uh nancy aaron's coffee time yeah this is a again one of those hopper-esque kind of paintings and actually talking to uh, uh to nan afterwards uh, she had mentioned she had just seen the hopper show uh and i think was largely inspired by it uh, and I, I like this number, first off, I liked it more in, uh, as a compositional piece where I feel like I can weave through this coffee shop that had that kind of quietness, uh, you know, felt like any coffee shop that you could enter into. But then I kind of like the Hopper paintings got wrapped up with the loneliness, that solitary figure, which acts as the, um, as the focal point in the painting kind of looks like she's sketching actually. Uh, but, you know, this feel, felt like a, a Nighthawks kind of uh, layout where, you have all these people kind of in their own little worlds, their own little pensive kind of uh, environments, uh, mindsets, whatever it may be. Um, so I, I, I like this as a kind of reinvented version of Hopper painting. Uh, it still has an, uh, an air quality to it that uh, sometimes Hopper feels a little bit dense to me, uh, especially in the figurative work. And I think the Nancy did a great job of kind of undoing and made it her own. Uh, so I commend her for that undertaking and also just a really nice painting where I can create a lot of narrative and a lot of story out of it. Hopper was also big at having like a, a element of extreme light that would mm -hmm. often come in in a diagonal and congratulations for, to Nan for yeah, capturing the, that kind of strong light that's so interesting as well. Yeah, and that's really makes it kind of, a, you know, he was at the end of Hopper's life, he was almost just painting only light on walls because the abstract quality of them was just so enticing. And I, I like that kind of homage that's paid in this painting. That was good. Good point, Patrick. Thank you. All right, let's go to first prize now. Seth Fariano, Seven Train. Oh, if you haven't talked to Seth about, I mean, he talked to me after, uh, during the reception about some of the stories that he uh, created, or well, I guess came out of painting the series of, of Paint the Trains in New York, but uh, I thought that his stories were almost as exciting as the painting itself, where, you know, he would invent these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, trains that were based on his experiences, and then he would actually find these people riding the same train maybe a week later. Uh, it did kind of feel like a little bit of a horror story, but uh, fascinating stories. So I would encourage you to seek Seth out and hear about uh, the painting uh, um, directly from him. Um, as it related to me, though, you know, just kind of journey from without that uh, knowledge, uh, this felt like a reminiscent of a, a Van Gogh bedroom. You know, the kind of the perspective on the floor, the color on the wall, the uneasiness of being in this space. Um, that, that was really exciting for me to see that it's not just a, a pretty picture, that it's e evoking some sort of emotional response, even if it's not one that I want to have, you know, that uneasiness, uh, it was still really exciting to just be a bear witness to this weird painting where it felt like everyone was, you know, Soma kind of drug, you know, I can't remember which sci-fi book was Soma, was that 84? Or, I think so. Um, but, um, you know, it has that kind of feel to it where it's, something's off, something's very weird. And I, the viewer of the painting, kind of have to untangle this message, uh, this kind of narrative that's happening within this train situation. 
I just, I just want to know what that guy in the foreground with the orange shirt is doing, thinking, going. Uh, it's weird. If he's asleep or if he's in contemplation or, or what. No, I like paintings that, you know, it's not just like I'm enjoying all the experience. You know, I think that we are inundated with a lot of beautiful painting that sometimes something a little odd, a little off will, will be more impactful as you know, the viewer down the line, you know, I think that's why certain painters like, you know, like Osama or uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of some of Louis Bourgeois, like these kind of painters, they make you uneasy, but they stick with you a little bit more than just the, you know, the the, the pretty painters in a way. So that's that's kind of why I like this painting. It's not what we call it a pretty painting. It's well done, but it definitely has a a, a, a kind of a there. A, an uneasiness about it that's exciting uh, and worth and worth looking at. And every time you look at it, uh, and this goes for many of the paintings there, you'll see something new. I've yeah. seen this online. I've seen it hanging. I've put labels on it. You know, we've done all of that. But it wasn't until right now that I noticed that the Chrysler building is in the far background out the door. I think that's great. I also noticed today that there are no cell phones in that painting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh oh, that's dating it, isn't it? No, that's the horror story. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> well, it's just why, uh, why? I mean, that one guy in the blue who's kind of central to the composition, he's looking at us, the viewer, kind of reminiscent of like a, a um, oh shoot, who's the Dutch painter? Um, um, well, we'll, we'll take a different painter, like Caravaggio's uh, Bacchus, where the, you know, when somebody's looking at you, um, it, it kind of sparks a, 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 like a whoa, like some, somebody in the painting is identifying the viewer. So that guy in blue, even though he has his eyes closed, you, I kind of get this feeling like, why aren't you getting off the, this train? Why are you still here? Like, get off. There's something bad going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, okay, thanks. Shall we go to the next category? Sure. Our next court category is watercolors. We'll start with honorable mention, Alexandra Michaels, Catfish. Yeah, Alexandra did a fabulous job on this. You know, it's, you know, I, I imagine she's using a reference of a catfish, but then in kind of inventing the colors and the values and the environment uh, to kind of really make this just a dynamic composition. I like the way that the abstract shapes of the, I'm going to guess, branches of some sort are kind of moving you towards the center of the painting and using the rocks below us to kind of create this, we are underwater feeling to it. Uh, but there's just a, also a technical uh, way of using the watercolor where it, it's, it's using the watercolor to feel like watercolor. You know, I, I think that to me is, um, I like watercolor for it's, it's you know, I guess the, pro the properties that make it watercolor and why it's different from oil paint. So I think if this were in any other medium, it wouldn't have the same kind of feel, lightness and airiness, that kind of fish moving through water. Uh, so technically well done and, and just a, a joy to look at. Okay, let's move on to another honorable mention, Cecile Kirkpatrick, Bern, Switzerland. Yeah, I love the atmosphere in this one. So, you know, really utilizing that kind of idea that dark colors will come forward especially when you have that atmospheric perspective working uh, for you. And if I look at just the, the elements in the foreground with this kind of this uh, figurine uh, or statue, I should say, uh, holding the sphere. And then I look at what's directly behind it, kind of the building clock tower and the building way back there has this kind of orange glow to it, which is the same kind of colors that are working in the sky. There's a tremendous amount of space here. Uh, and that large amount of sky and the atmospheric perspective enable her to kind of utilize a lot of those little small details of the bus and, and the people and where it doesn't feel overwhelming. So I think that she handled the large abstract shapes and the kind of the smaller uh, detailed forms beautifully where they balance each other and create an extraordinary uh, composition. I think the reds play a, a big part in this too, even though it's a small Color-wise, it's one of the, the more minor colors, but boy, they jumped, don't they? All right, let's go to third prize, Sandy Yagel, mixing it up with shadows. 
Oh man, I would, I I have a, a mixer in our kitchen, and I have to. It's it's a larger one. We have to lug it up and down all the time. And my wife always says, "Well, will you move the di- mixer up and down?" And my wife, the the baker, is 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 uh, constantly working with the mixer, so it's probably once a week. I have to lug that mixer up and down. Uh, but I, I felt the weight of it. You know, with that, you know, my experience with the mixer that we have at home and this, you know, watercolor rendition of it. It had that kind of density to it uh, that um, that felt like the actual object, um, and it was done in a medium that I probably would not have actually uh, thought that would work well for that subject matter. You know, watercolor is traditionally a more white, or not a white, but a, 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 a light um, kind of medium, light and airy. But she's made this uh, this mixer feel very heavy, even with a medium which I attribute to be kind of lightweight. Um, so it, it's it's a little bit out of my comfort zone to actually see uh, the painting done this way, uh, but I, it's you know the way it's lit, it's 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 dynamic. The composition's interesting with the the way that the 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 window lattice is kind of leading me to the subject matter, uh, the re- repetition of color from the background into the foreground into the mixing bowl itself. You know, I thought it was really well done. I, I love the uh, shadow of the lattice in the window, mm-hmm. giving the mixer, you know, the curved shape. Um, yeah. I mean, she did that with shadows as well, but she, it really is enhanced with with the uh, the shadow, you know, through the window of the panes in that window. So good for yeah. her. I love the window. Just the simplicity of those those uh, colors and values. Uh, the window by itself, she could do an entire painting. Uh, just of, of windows, and I'd be happy. Great, thank you. Second prize, Alexandra uh, Treadway Hoare, Time and Weather Washed Away the Pier. This is one of those pieces where I, I, I strongly suggest that you go see them in person. Uh, there's a lot of detail hidden within the waves. Uh, the blue actually is not just a flat color, there's a lot of kind of swirling kind of purples laced within there. Uh, the textural qualities that she gives to all the elements in the water and in the, uh, I guess the wooden pylons there, uh, those, it's just really, really, really uh, nice to see placed against this kind of very flat sky. Uh, if you think of that just from a compositional standpoint, the way that the waves are lined up kind of counter to the pylons there and kind of, you know, horizontal at the top and then diagonal kind of about maybe two thirds of the way down. I think that is really, uh, really genius about how those triangles are kind of placed against each other. So a lot of dynamic elements, you know, we think about dynamic versus static compositions. This is full of dynamic composition uh, and, and everything's lined up just about right. Uh, and I do love the textures. The textures to me, you have to see them in person to really admire them and, and enjoy them. Um, the textures just make this a, def- a, a definite must see. Thank you. Let's go to our first prize, which is Angela Lacey, City Bike. Yeah, think about it. I just mentioned the dynamic versus static compositions. This would be a static composition. Uh, Typically, I'd say static compositions, you know, those are compositions that are mostly horizontal and vertical elements. Uh, There's not a lot of massive diagonals within a static composition to lead me through the, uh, the composition. But Angela does a great job of where she does throw a few diagonals, I'm kind of looking at the V diagonal all the way down uh, the shadows I'm imagining uh, on the wall there, that does a lot of work. You know, it's very kind of risk, uh, risky kind of painting uh, to employ all these horizontals and still hope that it'll actually work out as a composition. You know, it's very symmetrical in a lot of ways, but where she does put those kind of diagonals really enables my eye to kind of meander through the actual uh, painting uh, where I don't get bored. I can still have places to observe and admire her technique, which of course is always extraordinary um, in, in, in all the work that she does. But I really like this painting for just the layering effects, the verticals and horizontals, and then really well-placed diagonals where they count. And if anybody has ever tried to paint a bicycle or more specifically a bicycle wheel, you will just admire how she convinces <laughs> us that those are absolutely round. You know, it's funny, and like, those, tried to... so, yeah, I agree. They're, they're so detailed, those bicycles. Um, 
but I, I think I spend more time looking at the window structure. You know, it's yeah. like where the the kind of the crossbars of the windows disappear into the the black, for instance. Those are exciting moments where my eye actually has to do a little bit more work to finish uh, and complete the painting. You know, she's still, even when given a lot of detail like she has with the bicycles, there are places where the detail kind of disappears and enables me, the viewer, to kind of finish the painting. And I need that in the painting. I, I don't like where everything's given to me all the time. I like having moments where uh, I, my eye has to finish, my brain has to finish the painting. It's more of a collaboration that way. Great. Let's go to our next category, uh, which is pastels, drawings, and prints. Um, honorable mention, uh, Sharon Rankins, dancers. Technique is great. And I love, love, love drawings. Uh, this is a, pen and ink is not an easy thing to actually work with, especially even like a kind of like idea of a cross contour, like in the legs and the forms of the, of the dancer in the four, the you know, human dancer. Um, the, the, the pen and ink was really well done for this one way, where the darks are placed, what is important focal point wise, uh, I thought was exceptional. Uh, subduing the kind of the Degas dancer behind the, uh, the, the young person in the foreground, uh, the way that that's treated is, is why this was included as an honorable mention. The fact that those, the handling of the Degas sculpture is subdued and almost pushed into the background to enable the uh, figure in the foreground to become more, more of the focus, more present. Uh, I was imagining, or at least trying to imagine, if that sculpture had been rendered the same way as the figure in the foreground, like how successful would this be? And I think that Sharon did the right thing to do and just kind of place the focus on uh, the figure in the foreground and then enable the viewer to kind of go back in space, enjoy the atmospheric perspective, done with the pen and ink, which is not easy to do. Let's go to third prize, Antonia Two, the tourist. Yeah, this felt like a, I felt like a tourist, you know, observing this and just especially like this does feel like a, a small Italian type town. Uh, I, to me, it does. I mean, just mostly the gestures of the figure in the foreground there with the cane, uh, the shadows, the cast shadows created that did feel like uh, Italy. Um, and of course, you know, any, any kind of painting that is outside the U.S., you know, if I've been there or been to something like that and I've experienced the uh, that's that environment, uh, um, not alongside the artist, but like in, in context, like I think that those paintings and drawings have more of a, a presence. I love the amount of detail that's placed into the bricks. I think the street itself and how the details and the shadow kind of disappear once sunlight has touched it. I thought that was probably the best part of the painting, that kind of walkway. Um, I'd actually like to see more uh, those situations where the detail really get kind of abolished by sunlight uh, kind of reminds me of like a John Singer Sargent kind of a, a approach whenever um, sunlight touches the subject matter in his watercolors and his drawings, he almost just leaves that area white. And I think that that, uh, that, that walkway there is just absolutely gorgeous, especially with the figure uh, kind of placed against it. Um, great depth in the painting, great details. Um, I like the abstract shapes created by the buildings as well, but to me, it's that that walkway, that stone is just gorgeous. Well done. Second prize, Diane Weiner, friendship. This just pulls on the heartstrings. Like I don't know how to say it otherwise. You know, this is, you know, you may not have a thing for cows. I mean, cows are not my favorite animal, but it does kind of remind me of just almost like a human experience where, you know, one partner is leaning in for a kiss and subconsciously the other partner is kind of pulling away because it's just not the right time or maybe there's morning breath, who knows. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that this has a very human aspect to it, even when they're cows. Um, from a technical standpoint, I mean, there's nothing to, uh, to, to lose with this exceptional drawing hand. Uh, I love those moments where like the outside edge of the cow uh, that's kind of facing us, or sorry, the off the left, not really facing, but glancing at us. Like where that line where it kind of disappears into a purely drawn line where you lose the rendering and almost becomes just like an expressive tool. Uh, I like that kind of blend of high realism and almost abstract mark making. So as the, as the drawing goes down, it almost kind of disappears into the paper itself. 
Uh, I think if this were, you know, background was, was rendered, you have a landscape behind these cows, things like that. I think it would really deter from the action that's happening here in the imagery. So um, I think it was, it was stopped at the right point, it was executed at the right point. And I like how the cows kind of meld together. Like they're, you know, like they're meant to be, they are, they are kind of uh, uh, partners. And, and isn't there something about cows that just make you feel calm? <laughs> this one makes me feel calm. I don't know. Bulls are, I guess it's not a cow, but a bull is, is, you know, is the opposite for me. But. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm blown okay. let's, let's move on to our first prize, Kathleen Tynan, Waiting at Winter Harbor. I, I love this palette. You know, just the choices for colors was just well done. And I like when colors repeat. So if you look at like the boat that has kind of the blue body, the interior of it's kind of purple, that same purple is repeated throughout the composition. In the background, creating that atmospheric perspective. In the foreground, kind of in the reflections of the waves. And I, I like when that happens where the same color can be used in different amount of spaces and still use where you have that sense of depth and have that sense of space there. Um, of course, the craft is just was is is wonderful. You know, clearly uh, Kathleen has the handle of the, of the pastels um, and the color choices and and so forth. But I really like that depth, that really amount of space there, where the whole background, the whole uh, uh, sliver at the, uh, at the upper third or so of the painting, really kind of repeats in the foreground in that negative space. And then I have my middle ground as my focal point there. So I really really enjoy the way this is laid out. And those places where there are sparks of color within the boats, you know, you have this orange kind of life vest kind of repeating throughout or the planks that you would sit on. I think those moments where you have strong color or how my eye kind of hops from one element to the next. Um, yeah, it's a great painting, really, really well done. And it has a calmness to it that uh, I feel when I look at it. It's great. Let's move to our next category, which is uh, mixed media collage experimental. Honorable mention, Michio Mizushi, I am chasing you. This one was to me about circus. You know, if you think about what, what makes good, I, I guess uh, not abstract, uh, pigeonholed, but I think what, if you're non-objective, you know, you're just kind of approaching a painting without any preconceived notions of what it's gonna look like, or what it's gonna be. Uh, personally, my, my feeling for that kind of work uh, has to have that spontaneity, number one has to have a lot of variety of things for me to look at and has to have a good organization of those elements. And I think this painting is a good uh, example of, there's a lot going on. It doesn't feel overwhelming though. You know, I like that line work that's kind of uh, hidden throughout the composition, especially in the line, uh, the line work in the yellow, uh, where I have this kind of bright white kind of peeking behind this element that's very purple and orange and blue, kind of more central to the painting. I, I like those moments where, uh, there's a lot of, of things going on, but it's not overwhelming to me as the viewer. Great use of color in this, good balancing of colors with the oranges and the blues and the purples and the yellows. Uh, those complementary balancing points to me are, are uh, often done poorly. And then this one is an example of, of a really nicely done uh, color balance to the painting. Dramatic colors here. Yeah. Third prize, Jane Silverman. A rose for Aaliyah. This is a nice uh, example that you really have to see in person. And I, what's neat about this one is kind of the transition from flat to three-dimensional. And it's a little bit hard to kind of see in this uh, context of a flat, you know, two-dimensional computer image. Uh, but when you go to the mansion to kind of see this in person, what is raised off the, off the surface of the, I guess, canvas or panel, whatever it may be, uh, is, is, is unique. You know, the hands are protruding, the rose is protruding. So it kind of has this kind of weird optical flip-flopping between what is flat and what is not flat. And I think that Jane does a really nice job of selecting the, the appropriate subject matter to raise from the surface and other uh, to actually uh, to recede into the, the flats, flatness of the canvas. I'm gonna call it canvas, I don't know. Um, from a technical standpoint, I really enjoy the, some of those moments where you have, you know, a background, but it's not just a flat background. You know, she's found similar values and similar colors kind of laced together as kind of pinks and blues and yellows crisscross throughout the background. 
but it still reads the large negative space for my eye to rest. Kind of placed against that, you have the foreground and the table setting for the roses where it's just beautiful tapestry of, of shapes and colors and values, these blues and reds and variety of different types of blues and reds, it's not just uniform. And it has this kind of turn to it to make it a little bit uneasy. You know, I almost feel like that within this tablecloth, those the the bases on the on the uh, table can kind of slide off to the right because of the diagonal, or fall forward because of the way that the 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 um the pattern is kind of uh, placed. So there's a lot of kind of strange things going on in this painting, uh, but they're really really kind of neat. So a lot going on in this painting, uh, and and done very well. Thank you for mentioning the background. I mean, I've seen this in person and, and obviously online. What always struck me was the three-dimensional element, which you mentioned, and the bold colors. But it wasn't until right now that I took a moment and looked at that background. And, and thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, I think, second I think part. One, one more thing. I think what's nice about painting and also mixed media is, is there enough to hold my interest for more than a couple seconds? And those areas like backgrounds and kind of playing within the spaces, you know, uh, some of the oil paints earlier where it's like a dark area, I'm thinking that's like the, the crab shack type one, you know, where I can explore more and more within the painting and not just get the, the impact of the painting and then move on. When it holds my attention for more than a little bit, I think that's that's kind of the difference between what excites me and what I, I can kind of bypass. Okay, let's move on to our second prize. Marilyn Alpert, Future Untold. <laughs> this one is just strange, but it's a good strange. You know, I, I look at the portrait part and I, I, it's reminiscent of kind of like a Francis Bacon where it's not perfectly modeled. Not, you know, you don't really want to, you know, I, I know the model uh, that because I met her at the, at the um, reception and I don't think the artist has anything against the model. I promise you that, but there's just something uneasy about this painting, it kind of feels like a little bit uh, Stephen King-ish, you know, deliverance, or not deliverance, but uh, 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 misery, yeah, misery kind of feel to it where I don't really want to be interacting with this character. And then it's juxtaposed against gold leaf. And gold leaf to me is kind of this perfect, you know, it's used for uh, icons, it's used for, you know, like saints and so forth. So kind of like this haunting character placed against gold leaf to, you know, there's a lot of narrative that can be pulled against or pulled out of this situation. Um, so you have to see this in person because, again, I don't think the photograph does a great job showing the kind of the layering, the you know, protrusion of these, kind of, I'm guessing, tarot cards um, from the, you know, that is behind the, the main character here. You know, how it's protruded from the gold leaf is really quite nice. Plus, there's a little bit of reflection on um, uh, on the imagery. Uh, so I, th I think this is, those are, these are one of the situations where I'm really glad I got to see it in person um, uh, to make a, a, a judge's decision on its place in the, in the, in the mix. Uh, but craft is incredible. And the stories that I can create from this is, is just is, is, is really great. It's just love it, love it. And you will certainly always remember this work of art. It, 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 <laughs> For sure. It, it's made an imprint. Yep. So let's go to first prize, Bill Johnson, Billy and Raj Discover Coffee. Yeah, the, the title actually threw me for a, a bit. Like I can I can see like the idea of, um, you know, maybe this is like the aromas of coffee kind of meandering through the atmosphere of the air uh, or or maybe even kind of like, a, um, you know, how would you describe in an abstract form what coffee tastes like? Uh, but to me, this is another one where I had to see it in person, just looking at the, the layering of the mediums, the textures on the surface, the atmosphere created by the simplicity of the medium. Uh, those are really why I chose this to be um, uh, the first place for the mixed media category. Um, I like the way that the line work kind of transitions space. You know, in the front, it's very dense. Behind that, to the right, it's more atmospheric, and then it almost like disappears completely, as much like smoke does. You know, kind of uh, deteriorates as it moves away from the source. I like that rich kind of landscape-like quality at the bottom there, where there's a strong contrast between the dark and the light, kind of acting as an anchor point uh, for the rest of the line to kind of protrude from. So I really uh, think compositionally, it's it's fabulous. 
texture wise, extraordinary. And composition with the negative spaces, like I've been talking about, there are those places where I can kind of explore and rest a little bit before I jump back into all the intricacies of the line work and the patterning that is done uh, within those kind of more focal point uh, subject matter uh, in, in the center and off to the right there. Yeah. You know, you've mentioned a few times that you really should do yourself a favor and see it in person. Absolutely. Um, and certainly within this mixed media category, that in-person part is so important. Yep, it was the one, it was the one category where I really made some decisions at the at seeing it in person. Uh, I thought that the mixed media at the, the show was, was really, really strong this year. Uh, and I've been, I imagine it's, it's good every year, but I, I really uh, fell in love with a lot of the techniques that were done uh, in the show. Okay, so let's go to our next category, uh, which is sculpture and ceramics. Pearl Chang, Resolute, honorable mention. Yeah, fabulous job of just, you know, creating that kind of likeness and it had a lot of emotion to it as well. Like there's wasn't not necessarily a happy sculpture. This had a kind of a sadness to it or I guess re resolute uh, feel to it as well. I didn't actually know that the title when I was drawing it, um, but I like the form. I like the technique. I like the volume created. It did feel very technically well done. Uh, but I did kind of have this kind of somber reaction to the piece. It, 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 it sparked emotion. And to me, that's a large part of, of what makes good art is, you know, anything but boring is, is, a, is, a, is a mantra uh, for so many uh, artists and art reviewers. But this is definitely one of those situations where um, I think about, you know, Kathy Kolwitz and some of these artists who don't necessarily tackle uh, nice things, but things that need to be said or are talked about. Uh, so she, you know, I think that Pearl did a great job of creating kind of a reflect, a reflective kind of sculpture where uh, maybe it's not the happiest of emotions, but uh, I certainly, uh, certainly feel something. Let's go to our third prize, Jerome Parmet, Rock Climber. This felt very whimsical to me. Um, and actually it raised more questions than I think that was, than the answers. You know, I like the way, especially from, it's actually a different angle where that it's a, the pitch of the more vertical aspect is kind of slanting a little bit more towards the, uh, the rock climber. Um, but like, where is he jumping from? Like, you know, I think those kind of narrative questions that, you know, I'm looking at the sculpture, but I'm more thinking about what else is the, the, um, the artist not showing me. Like, how did he get there? <laughs> how is he going to get up there? Um, a little bit more playful than, uh, than some of the other pieces in the show, but I really do enjoy the, the playfulness of the, uh, of the piece. And I like the way that there is kind of a, a, a um, kind of a split between how things were done, where the figure feels very different than the way that the rocks are feeling. You know, it's very angular, very static versus more fluid, more whimsical for the figure. Uh, so it was a nice kind of uh, dichotomy there. The, um, this is sort of funny. Um, the, the artist was present in the, during the Meet the Artist yesterday, and um, he had a, a bag where he had extra rocks. He was so worried that in you know, placing the art, we might have lost some of the rocks that weren't glued down. So he had extras just in case. I thought that was fun. All right, let's go to the next one. Second prize, Nancy Jakubowski, so happy together. Uh, th this may actually think back towards the cows, actually, the drawing uh, in, a, in a different form. You know, it's like, how do you take that kind of same idea in a different medium? You know, much like the drawing that we, we saw earlier with the cows, this kind of had the same kind of, you know, heartstrings kind of thing where you have this mother and, and a child type uh, whale form kind of moving through space done in a you know, clay um, and juxtaposed against the wood. I think there's a lot to be said about, um, you know, just the technique alone between the mediums, but also just, you know, how, how, it, may, how it evokes an emotion to it. Um, and, you know, coloring layout, I just, you know, I thought it was an incredibly well-crafted piece. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, great, thank you. First prize, Sandra Franklin Ellers, duo. Yeah, I like the, the title duo when it actually is a very kind of singular unit, um, but just kind of 
it's kind of attached to the hip, no pun intended. Um, I did feel uh, like the simplicity was its success. You know, the very kind of stark uh, tattooing done into the marble versus the very smooth kind of aspects, the flow to it, the very stark kind of diagonals set against kind of the uh, more curved kind of uh, general form in there. Uh, so from a technical standpoint, uh, it look, it, it's an abstract piece, but done to feel like it's part of maybe a classical kind of, um, what am I thinking of? You know, it, could be, it belongs with a bunch of classical kind of Greek or Roman kind of type sculpture. It could be like a lower back, but done in a, a very strange kind of more contemporary way. So I, I like the way that the, the, the artist is handling marble. And of course, marble has just so many con uh, connections in my head, uh, um, history and so forth. So having it kind of done this way, um, I think it was interesting. I like how that things are kind of slightly raised here and there and uh, just a great shape. There, there's something about sculptures. You, you just kind of want to go up and touch them. You know, the, the rough part, the, the middle of the back, the soft parts on the edges. Of course, you're, you're not supposed to touch them. Yeah, you have to get permission from the artist. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get that permission today. Uh, our final category is uh, photographs. And uh, third prize, Kathy McDermott, Green 2. This is just a, a delightful uh, piece. And, and actually, you know, the, I, I kind of took a little bit of time for me to really identify. Of course, I saw the, uh, 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 the I'm going to guess butterfly, maybe a moth. Um, I'd have to tell when its wings are closed. But um, I, that, that, that I saw. But just the general shapes of the leaves versus the shapes of the wings and how similar they are. The repetitions of the the shapes and the values is really kind of the fun aspect of it, um, and I, I thought it's risky to place your subject matter so central. And I think choosing this photograph or maybe the hundred other photographs that she may have taken of the subject matter, you know, I think she made the right choice of just the way the leaves are pulling you away from the subject matter, but back to the subject matter over and over again. Uh, how the space is in the bottom right corner, that kind of triangular shape. Uh, the little dark shape in the upper left corner, they kind of balance out the photograph, uh, enable you to kind of move through this space, explore the edges of the leaves, come back to the, the butterfly, I'm assuming, um, over and over again. There's uh, an awful lot of green, but you don't really think green, you think this beautiful butterfly. It's so mm -hmm. great. Okay, um, second prize, Mauricio Athi. Springtime of Eiffel 2. This is just a, a, one of those playful kind of photographic kind of collages that, you know, I, it takes a little bit of decipher. You know, I imagine I'm almost like bending my neck back, looking from the bottom of the Eiffel Tower, and not quite seeing what we stereotypically think of as the Eiffel Tower, but still identify it as the Eiffel Tower. Even if I didn't have the title, I would still know the location, but it's not the stereotypical kind of pristine from afar and looking at from like this kind of romantic Paris kind of thing. It's we're looking at the architecture of it, like the nitty gritty, like how it was constructed. And then the bending of the imagery really kind of uh, makes it feel super tall, even from this point of view. Um, I like the kind of the the kind of the two images placed once uh, side by side, it almost feels kind of graphic novelish where there's a kind of a gutter between the two photographs, the left and the right, where something is happening in between there. Uh, so it's kind of a unique way of presenting the um, kind of the, the imagery, uh, which I, I, I thought was, was good and different. And it's quite large. It's um, 40 inches by 20. Yeah. So got a nice size to it. When I first saw this, um, you know, I thought it was a black and white photo, but when it's hung and you see it in person, you notice, you know, at the bottom of the one on the right, the greens and the the red, reds in the clothing, mm -hmm. and on the the one on the the left, you see the the gold element of the statue of Eiffel. And it's how, how small that little landscape is down at the bottom on the right. You know, it really makes the the tower feel so much bigger. Right. Okay. First prize, Lisa Sieg, Cloud Dance. Lisa, did you want to say anything? <laughs> okay. Um, no, I, 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 I love this. What's that? I was stunned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm looking at this um, purely abstract.
you know, it has so much atmosphere, you captured and, you know, the, the right shapes at the right time. And I don't know how many photographs you kind of edited down to this, but there's little small elements like the lamppost there uh, that kind of ground you. And I think without those little small elements, the grandeur of the imagery probably wouldn't have the same impact. And I'm looking at just the ridge of the, the, of the, the kind of brightest of, of the clouds kind of near the top and how that kind of sets against this kind of more shadowed blue kind of end of the evening kind of feel to it. Uh, so it did have this real grandeur to it from this photographic standpoint where I, the viewer, feel very small. And some of the elements you have, like that lamppost, kind of emphasize that smallness of humanity versus the grand qualities of, of nature. So uh, that's that's really what I was looking for at this, this uh, photograph. But it's so good, Lisa, it really is. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. You know, I, with, I think with all photographs, um, you know, the elements of composition, does it tell a story, the, the mm -hmm. movement feel, the, the color, um, that's what makes photography such a wonderful medium and art. And I, I don't think that people that don't spend a lot of time with photos know how painstaking it is. You know, thousands of images uh, are captured Yet it's it's with the artist's eye that the the one that that tells the story the best has the best composition is the one that makes it all the way through to a, a finished piece of art. So congratulations there. Yeah, I think there's a lot of luck to photography, but then on the flip side to that, there's a lot of knowing what to edit down or pair out. And like if you have a hundred photographs and one of them's good, knowing which one is the good one, you know, I think that is an art in itself, you know, first to uh, recognize that this needs to be photographed mm -hmm. and then to take that knowledge and then to pare that down into the one. I think that's even more complicated. Okay, <laughs> we will move on to um, the best in show. Harvey Levine, contemplation, collage. Yeah, I complained to Harvey actually at the, the show that his photograph definitely does not do this painting justice or this mixed media piece uh, uh, justice. Uh, so please, guys, you have to see this in person to really kind of get what I'm talking about. But I think I mentioned some of the elements uh, that made this the kind of best in show throughout the choices that I've already described uh, for you guys earlier. You know, places where you know, you have this dark kind of area off to the upper right where there's so much going on there, but it still has the ability to, to act as a place for my eye to rest, where I would discover iguanas in the corner or small little uh, paintings on the wall. And I still will go back to the subject matter, the focal point in the subject matter uh, each and every time. So I'm exploring kind of the, the amount of time and effort and choices that the artist is doing and still enjoying the narrative that's also being kind of uh, uh, created by the, the imagery choices. I feel like there are so many opportunities to get lost in this painting. And actually, I think there's actually, there is a lot more of a floor uh, in the actual piece than in, in this uh, image of it. So I think the actual piece that you see in person is gonna feel very different than this image of it. So uh, see it in person. Get, it, get lost in the floor patterns because there's a lot more of them. You have the foot, the hands, you know, it's just a, a really nice piece, uh, but he definitely needs to do a better job of photographing. I will not let him get away with just having a nice piece, uh, but uh, check it out in person. The, 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 the story is great. I feel like I'm in Paris. Uh, I love the way the gesture of the model is created and the places and the abstractions. It's just, it's a really nice uh, piece. Maybe we'll twist his arm and get him to um, give us another uh, photo image of this one that we can then put into the, the virtual show. Yeah, I will end on my, my judge's comment of uh, photograph your work whenever you're submitting and photograph it well, because you're not gonna get into many shows if you do it poorly. That's well, my- You know, the, the topic of, of <laughs> photographing art is could be a whole, um, course of study in itself. And um, I think that the common theme amongst all artists is how difficult it is to, to get the colors right, the, you know, all the elements of taking a picture of your art. 
here's the here's my my uh, my very quick educational thing for all the people who stuck through this uh, this artist talk is find a cloudy day, find a place to go outside on a cloudy day when the when the light is bouncing kind of more uniformly, not on a bright sunny day, and photograph it outside in a cloudy day that does help get rid of a lot of the glares like you noticed in Harvey's there was a big glare on the right uh, where I, I was a, wasn't able to see in the photograph all the amazing work that he put into that painting and it gets rid of a lot of glares and the colors are usually a little bit closer to the way you the artist intended it to be if you have the use of um, like Photoshop or Lightroom some of those uh, subscription services the, the really easy navigation of like Finding the white correction will help quite a bit too. But uh, if you're just photographing it and you don't want to learn a lot of stuff, don't do it indoors. Go outside on a cloudy day and do it. All right. Well, this this wraps up our our um, presentation of the award winners from our 2023 Spring Jury Show. Jordan, thank you so much for of the course. efforts, virtually and in person, coming to the opening yesterday sitting with us today for this recorded session. We can't thank you enough. Absolutely, and all the uh, Rockville Art League members are always welcome to pop by the Stone Tower Studio at Glen Echo Park. Um, usually there on the weekends, especially Saturdays. Um, and, uh, you know, just come in and chat about art. And if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about art and take some classes, I wouldn't say no to that either. <laughs> well, um, I, I suspect you're gonna have lots of, of visitors. Thank you again. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you.